Hello and welcome to the Katie Helper Show. Uh, we are so excited today. We have a great show lined up for you. We have joining us Mike Preisner, who I'm going to bring on in a second. Uh, and then we're going to kind of split the stream up into a more serious discussion about Afghanistan with Mike Preisner. And then I'm going to bring on Leslie Lee and Jamie Peck, and they're going to be on live in person. We're all vaccinated, just so everyone knows. So um, really excited. So much to talk about this war in Afghanistan. And I like couldn't be happier with the. I'm very unhappy with the situation. I'm very, I'm, what I'm happy about is the guests I'm about to bring bring on. Um, make sure you know it's welcome to the Katie Helper Show. Please subscribe um, to the YouTube video channel. Please become Patreon supporters at patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. Again, that's patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. Um, you can also, of course, listen to the podcast uh, and you can rate and review the podcast. And uh, that's all at, uh, it's all the Katie Helper Show all the time. And uh, again, gonna just, just jump into it. Just jump into it. I'm gonna bring on our guest who is uh, making his Katie Helper Show uh, appearance debut, although he is part of the Empire Files. He's a producer with the Empire Files. And as people probably know, uh, we've had on Abby Martin of the Empire Files. But this is, uh, this is he exists in his own world and his own, uh, he has his own identity. And he is an anti-war Iraq veteran. He's also the host of um, his own, very own podcast, he is the director of uh, Gaza Fights for Freedom, which is excellent. Co-director of that with Abby Martin. Um, the Eyes Left podcast is, is the podcast that you can listen to and you should listen to. And i um, just going to bring him in to answer our questions about Afghanistan. So, Mike, thank you so much for coming. Thanks for having me, Katie. Of course. So I just wanted to know your perspective on this as someone who was in, you know, who was an anti-war soldier, former soldier, a current veteran. I guess you're always a veteran. Um, what you thought of what's happening in, in Afghanistan, if you could just set us up, set up where we are right now. And I guess the question I have is kind of like what could have been done, what should have been done and what needs to happen now? You know, not too ambitious or anything. Sure. Well, you know, I just want to say at the outset, you know, I'm wasn't in Afghanistan. I was in Iraq. Um, you know, I joined the army like two months before the September 11th attacks in 2001. So I uh, witnessed the Afghanistan war from an inside perspective from the beginning, even though I was sent to the, uh, as Obama called it, the dumb war uh, instead of the smart war, which is Afghanistan, which we can talk about that whole framing. Um, but, you know, I, I've been super engaged in this issue through the duration because after I separated from the military in 2005 and became part of the anti-war movement, uh, since then, very much a part of organizing around the Afghanistan war specifically. So mobilizations for the anniversary of the Afghanistan, but in particular, working with active duty soldiers who were deploying to Afghanistan and Iraq. And so I got that inside perspective of organizing with Af Afghanistan veterans who are then returning to the country, helping them resist orders to go. And you know, still to this day, I'm, I'm frequently in touch with that community. Um, and so, you know, the, for, I know a lot of people like normally don't talk about Afghanistan. Of course, a lot of people are talking about it now who never talked about it before, but you know, our, my engagement with the issue of Afghanistan was always around creating a uh, media content and agitation directed at active duty soldiers who are about to deploy. And so having to follow the issue very closely because, you know, we were literally like on military bases talking with soldiers who are, had the orders to go and talking to them about their options for why they should not go and all of the political and strategic reasons why they shouldn't as well. And so I will say in my, my take on what's happening now is what we're seeing now is what we knew back in Obama's first term. Um, it was clear uh, back in, you know, I think in 2009, 2010, there was probably still some hope uh, among the Pentagon establishment that the war could be turned around. I mean, the Taliban were dispersed within the first months of uh, the US invasion. Um, but then once they started mounting a comeback, there's probably some belief in the Pentagon brass that they could turn the war around and emerge victorious. But by like 2011, uh, it was clear to the military establishment, the top generals, the commanders, all of them, they knew that they couldn't win. Uh, they knew that they could never defeat the Taliban. They knew that the only possible victory that the U.S. military and the U.S. government could get out of Afghanistan was 
putting enough military pressure on the Taliban where the Taliban would enter a power sharing agreement where they'd say, okay, we'll get 50% of the new government and the US backed puppet government will get 50%. So that since like 2010, that's what the US has been pursuing. The troop surge in Afghanistan, all these, all these massive strategies that led to large numbers of people dying on US and Afghan side and the NATO side. All of that was under the understanding that the US couldn't actually defeat the Taliban. All they could do is maybe give them enough of a bloody nose where the Taliban would concede and say, okay, you know what, we'll do a 50-50 government with you. So that's really been the goal of the war for the entire time. You know, in 2011 is when there was this major report came out uh, by a guy named Lieutenant Colonel Davis. And he was tasked by the, the Pentagon to travel to like every province in Afghanistan, you know, travel 9,000 miles across the country and give an honest assessment of how everything was going. And he came back and he went on to the media and said, we got to get out now. He's like, I've seen the war more than anyone else over a longer period of years than anyone else. And it is, we have lost and there's no possibility for us to win. I mean, this is back in 2011 that he did this. And so from that point on, I mean, the Pentagon knew that there was no military victory against the Taliban. The best they could do was a unity government. Even that was like, you know, it, it seemed almost impossible for them to accomplish because the Afghan puppet forces were not reliable. They weren't capable. And, you know, the Taliban was just a strong, uh, a strong resistance force. Um, and they knew then too, that the that, uh, that if there was a U.S. withdrawal, the very situation we're seeing today would happen. You know, then we had in 2019, we had the Pentagon Papers, that bombshell revelation that came out, which didn't make much of it. I mean, a little bit of a media splash, but not much. You know, Joe Biden was very much implicated in the Pentagon Papers as one of the people who helped cover up how badly the Afghanistan war was going, although that he got one debate question in the primary that was hammering him for it, but he's never really had to answer for that. But for those who don't know, really what the Pentagon Papers revealed was that particularly throughout the Obama administration, all of the generals were going to the White House and saying, by every metric, we have lost the war, by every metric. And the Obama administration went back and said, we'll create a metric that has us winning the war. So they created all these false charts for progress of, oh, we built this many schools compared to the five years before. So that shows we're winning. They just created all these like fake uh, rationales to show that there was progress, to deceive the American people into thinking that there was some hope for a, a victory in Afghanistan while they knew all along they were just lying to the American people. You know, so for example, like the maps that we're seeing now of how quickly the Taliban took over, where you see the provinces outlined and saying two months ago, the Afghan government controlled all these provinces and now it's all Taliban control. I mean, most of those have been under Taliban control forever for, since, you know, the Afghanistan papers revealed that the U.S. was just lying about what provinces the Afghan, U.S. backed Afghan government controlled. Um, so this has been, of course, a dire situation for the U.S. for a long time. For the United States, they know that it looks bad for the image of the empire, a war that they can't win, um, to just be bogged down for 20 years in a military quagmire where, you know, we can talk about how badly they were losing, but when they try to go out into the countryside, it's just, they're completely hammered and kicked back to the main bases. And then it's just this, you know, they could have dealt with maybe this endless stalemate situation, but that looks bad for the empire. And so for a long time, the Pentagon has acknowledged that they need to retreat, they need to leave. And really this is what happened under Obama. When Obama said, announced his troop surge, his flooding of soldiers into every remote area of Afghanistan, you know, having like broken up troop numbers to like 100,000 US troops in Afghanistan, bolstered by a lot of NATO forces too. I mean, this wasn't just a defeat for the US, but like every other major imperialist army was a part of this. Um, you know, when Obama announced, yes, we're gonna do this troop surge, but then we're gonna leave in two years, like announcing, uh, the end of the war. Um, they knew that they were going to be retreating. And so it's very similar to the Vietnam War, where once the White House and the Pentagon knew we've lost, we can't win, instead of just saying, well, if we've lost and we can't win, and the outcome of a, a, con a conquest by our enemies is uh, the same no matter what, why don't we just leave right now, S you know, and stop killing people and stop having our own people killed. But um, the hubris of the American political machine doesn't allow that. I mean, what president wants to admit defeat at the hands of an a, a yeah. insurgency that's using rifles from 100 years ago? Um, no one wants to be in that position of admitting defeat. And so what we've seen over the past more than a decade has really been a slow motion retreat by the US empire, knowing that eventually they're going to fully leave. But like Nixon did, the strategy of peace through honor 
meaning, yes, we've lost, we got to end the war, but we're going to kill a bunch more people on our way out. So it doesn't seem like the empire has just been defeated so badly. So that's really been the strategy is that acceptance that the U.S. would eventually leave. Of course, there is probably some debate in the You know what's incredible? And I'm a little. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. No, sorry. Uh, is I cut you off. It's also, okay. let me just refresh. I don't know if it's my end. I no longer see Katie, and I feel like maybe I'm hosting a show by myself now. Sorry, I just wanted to refresh. I'm not sure who's who's uh who's uh, uh glitches those were, but um. You know, it was amazing. I was listening to you on Brian Becker's show on his podcast. And I don't know if I ever knew this or I don't know if my politics were so naive that I didn't think this was a big deal. But I didn't realize this or that Bush, that the Taliban, and can you talk about this with, you know, you have more uh, info on this, but the Taliban said that they were willing to give up uh, Osama bin Laden and the United States said we refuse to negotiate with terrorists. Uh, that was... Again, it shouldn't have been shocking, but it was shocking. Can you talk about that and what the significance is and what that reveals about the United States' uh, you know, U.S. motives in Afghanistan? Yeah, well, you know, it's important to remind people that the Taliban had nothing to do with the September 11th attacks, no role in it. Of course, bin Laden, you know, from being essentially an operative of or an ally of the United States through the war in the 80s and funded by the United States, you know, had training camps and a base of operation for his Al Qaeda network in Afghanistan. You know, maybe there was some overlap with Taliban people going to some of the Al Qaeda schools. You know, they were in a war with a group called the Northern Alliance. And so they would send so some of their soldiers to Al Qaeda training camps that existed in Afghanistan. But the Taliban did not support the 9-11 attacks, condemned the 9-11 attacks, and did offer to extradite, arrest and extradite bin Laden. Um, so it was a shock to them when all of a sudden the U.S. was talking about the Taliban and why we got to overthrow the Taliban. And at that time, the, the Taliban was trying very hard to prevent that from happening. And we're not just talking about, you know, uh, this ragtag group that's just like issuing statements from the middle of nowhere in Afghanistan. I mean, Afghan Afghanistan had a robust like press uh, network. And so they'd have spokespeople that would give press conferences in English um, in uh, countries in, in the region and would be talking directly to the United States saying, we are trying to negotiate. They're like, we don't support what happened. We want to find a resolution. And they even said in these press conferences, the United States used to call us freedom fighters not too long ago. And then all of a sudden we're terrorists and uh, they won't negotiate with us. Um, and so that is what happened. As, as you recounted it, Katie, the, the Taliban offered a solution where the U.S. didn't have to invade and occupy and overthrow the government in Afghanistan, but that wasn't that wasn't really the motives for the U.S. going into Afghanistan. The U.S. didn't really invade Afghanistan because they thought they that was the only way to destroy al-Qaeda and get Osama bin Laden. They easily could have done that through other methods. The reason that they wanted to invade Afghanistan is because the Taliban weren't subservient collaborators to the United States. I mean, Clinton uh, in the 90s had tried very hard to build relationships. He didn't care that the Taliban lynched people when they came to power in the 90s. Um, he just cared that, you know, maybe they could sign an oil contract together. Um, Unical, the oil company, you know, flew delegations of Taliban leaders to Texas to go tour their, to stay in their ranches and discuss plans for oil pipelines. But, um, but they, the Taliban wasn't that interested in that kind of development. And they weren't a subservient client state to the United States. So any country that is in its own orbit its own independence and isn't a client to U.S. corporations or subservient to the U.S. government, they get targeted for destruction. And so when 9-11 happened, you know, the U.S. government said, great, this is perfect because we've been trying to negotiate with these guys and they won't let us build this pipeline or they won't let us have a military base. So we'll just overthrow them, set up our own puppet government, move over to Iraq, overthrow them, set up a gov puppet government, move over to Syria, Lebanon, uh, Iran, Somalia, Sudan, all of the countries that were on their list uh, for overthrow after the 9-11 attacks. And so that was the reason in the first place. And so, uh, I mean, that that's really been, I mean, that's really what's behind it. It was never really about Al Qaeda. It was never really about giving the Afghan people a better life from the Taliban or whatever. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's to answer your question. Yes, it was a totally unavoidable war in the first place. There was no reason to do it. But if you can remember at that time, I mean, support for it was high. I mean, the impact. I mean, sorry, did you mean unavoidable or avoidable? It was avoidable to go. Yeah. There's no reason from the standpoint right. of, preventing another terrorist sure. attack in the United States. You know, there's no reason at all. But 
it was used as a, a way for the U.S. to achieve its other objectives, which is proven by the fact that we ended up in Iraq a year later, which had a, less to do with 9-11 than the, the Taliban did. Right. And uh, you were talking, you know, it's really interesting because there's this kind of liberal left divide. We don't have to frame it that way. And we want to bring people uh, over to the to the light. But, you know, a lot of people considered, including Obama, obviously, considered F, uh, Iraq, no, Afghanistan, the good war, right? They, there's a kind of parallel between the way people frame the war in Afghanistan with the first Iraq war. There's a whole group of liberals who consider the first Iraq war, the good Gulf war, and the uh, war in Afghanistan, the good like response to 9-11. Um, and as you have pointed out and others have pointed out, that's not the case. And in fact, something really, I don't know if you know about um, uh, Phyllis and Orlando Rodriguez, uh, they started not in our name when their son, Greg, was in one of the towers and he was killed. And they like immediately knew that the US government was gonna try to use this to justify war. And they wrote a letter saying, not in our son's name, not in our name, not in our son's name. You know, he didn't die so that you could use his name to invade another country. And you know, she told me, Phyllis, I've had her on the show before. She told whoops. She told me that speaking of I'm, I'm about to mention something about the New York Times. So this is an, a good metaphor the way our our connections went out for the media uh, malfeasance. But she told me that she they wrote an op ed for the New York Times that they didn't publish. Can you imagine right after 9-11 you have one of the the people who died, their parents saying don't go to war in our son's name. How does New York, I, again, I'm being so naive, but can you imagine the gall of the, of the New York Times just not even printing that op-ed? Like not even seeing the newsworthiness of it. Like they're just right. such ideologues that they would not publish that. Yeah, you know, actually the first major demonstration against war in Afghanistan occurred, I think it was four days after the September 11th attacks. Um, it was about 40,000 people, so it was not a small crowd. The slogan of the march, the banner was, war won't bring our loved ones back. And the march was led by people who lost loved ones in the 9-11 attacks. And then all the headlines about this fairly significant anti-war demonstration after 9-11 was like, people rally in support of terrorists. And pe like people rally in support of negotiating with terrorists and not fighting terrorism and things like that. So it just gives you a window into kind of the, the war fervor in the country uh, post 9-11, which uh, continued for quite a long time. I mean, even, you know, even in the anti-war movement, there was an entire sector uh, that supported the Afghanistan war. And it was contra, I mean, even in, you know, organiz like, uh, right. like in Iraq veterans against the war and in the, before Obama, it was a controvert. It wasn't uh, okay to talk about Afghanistan too. In fact, it was like not in the points of unity for a long time because it was too alienating to lots of veterans who were in the anti-war movement. That I joined the army to go fight in Afghanistan. I didn't go to go fight in Iraq. Right. And it was a significant, a faction that had to be battled against for a long time. And so that's why when, you know, Obama essentially campaigned on that, he had campaigned on the intense opposition to the Iraq war. Um, but a kind of this idea that, oh, weren't we supposed to go fight in Afghanistan? And then immediately we went to Iraq and then we lost the war in Afghanistan. And so Obama's thing was, we're going to get out of Iraq, the dumb war, and then we're going to win the war in Afghanistan. And um, that, that got a lot of support from liberal-minded people as well. Um, but then it, that's when that new era began, which was really defined the Afghanistan war, where the U.S. said, okay, we were slacking, focusing too much on Iraq. So now we're going to get everyone out of Iraq and not everyone, but we're going to get a good portion of people out of Iraq and just send them right to Afghanistan. Um, and then we're going to try to completely overwhelm the Taliban. And even when the United States had an insane number of troops there. And they were all across, I mean, they were everywhere in Afghanistan. Um, there is really no place where they really could win or beat back the Taliban. And so I think that's one of the, the hidden histories of the Afghanistan war is just, you know, the only reason that US, I mean, you'd have US outposts out in the middle of the countryside with like 40 soldiers there, like 40 US troops. Um, this is what a normal day would be like. You'd get up, and this is just recounting from countless friends of mine. You would get up and you'd leave the gates of your base to go on a patrol that had no purpose other than to say, hey, we're here, we're patrolling this area. Um, soup, when you get 100 yards off the base, if you're lucky, when you start getting shot at by people that you do not see, they're like 1,000 yards away, just harassing you with sniper fire and machine gun fire. Um, so at some point on your little walk, your little pointless walk through a bunch of grape fields that have no purpose 
to walk through for any reason. Someone will get blown up by an IED um, because you're walking on paths every day. And, uh, you know, the characteristic, the signature wound of the Afghanistan war around that time, the surge time, was tri triple amputation. So losing usually two legs and one arm um, and your genitalia. I think that uh, when the troop surge happened, there was like a 92% increase in wounds to genitalia. That became really the most common wound. So you go why is that? Forward. I'm sorry, why, why is that? Just because... blowing up under you. Just under, yeah. So if you kept your legs, you probably got a, lost a bunch more uh, flesh down there. Um, so every day you'd go on these completely pointless, meaningless patrols where you're... But basically the point was just to get shot at, so then you know who to shoot back at, which most of the time they didn't anyway. And then you'd go back to your base at night, and then at night it would just come under heavy assault by missiles and mortars and indirect fire. And sometimes you'd have like hundreds of Taliban fighters assaulting a little outpost that had 40 US soldiers on it. And this was happening all over the country. And the only reason that these outposts didn't get totally overrun, and in a lot of cases you had Taliban fighters getting over the wall and being inside the US base and being killed inside the US base. The only, the job of US soldiers then was basically to be bait for these Taliban to come. It's like exactly like the Vietnam War. You're on a hilltop, you're just bait for Taliban to attack, and your job is to survive long enough for air support to get to you. So when you start getting attacked, you call in the air support, it takes 30 minutes or so for the Apache helicopters, the A-10s, the B-52 bombers to come in and just level the area where you're being attacked from with heavy munitions. Uh, so that was that really defined the troop surge era of the war. I mean, it was just a complete failure from a military standpoint um, of the US and it was just completely senseless bloodshed. And there was even a lot of uh, rebellion and opposition among you know, soldiers who are very pro-military and pro-war, but who were just trying to blowing the whistle on all of this, just saying, what is, there's no reason for us to do this. There's no reason for us to go on these convoys, no reason to go on these patrols. We're just meant to be bait. We're just meant to be sitting ducks. Um, and so from that, you know, all of those deaths then where it's completely pointless. And you know, then the US realized, okay, this strategy doesn't work at all. They retreated from all those areas all across the country, you know, places like Korangal Valley, which was considered like the most strategically important valley of the Afghanistan war. Like 120 US soldiers died just defending this one valley. And then at the end of the this two year period of huge battles there, the Pentagon said, you know what? This valley doesn't actually matter at all. We're just gonna go lead, go go back here. So that really was emblematic of the war. So then the US kind of pulled back to its main bases um, and that defined the war in the post surge era where ca US casualties went down, but that's because they basically had retreated from most of the country already. We're just hold up on their big bases where they're operating through proxy forces and special operations. Um, and then, you know, I mean, the ironic thing about that too is the u.s said the u.s casualties are getting too serious we need to just hide out on the bases and send our proxy forces out well when they tried that strategy the number one killer of u.s troops became the afghan soldiers they were training just killing them and so you'd have tons of people who were either taliban or just anti-us joining the afghan army and then within a week they're sitting there with u.s soldiers getting trained on how to shoot they just turn the guns around and kill all the u.s soldiers training them so then it became even too uh, strategically untenable to have so U.S. soldiers just training troops back in these supposedly super safe and secure bases. So from every angle, it was a totally total military defeat. And mind you, we're talking about a decade ago uh, that it was that bad. And they knew at that point we're not get, we're not going to make any more progress. Um, you know, Trump came in and thought he could win the war by taking bombing to a whole new level, and that was really Trump's legacy in Afghanistan. You know. Although he campaigned on ending the war, he was responsible for more civilian casualties than for two years in a row than any other previous year of the war, just through airstrikes. Um, and that says a lot because Obama was in charge of the troop surge. A lot of people died in the troop surge. Trump killed more people just by changing the rules of engagement so they could just really drop huge munitions everywhere in the country. Um, and that didn't do anything either. I mean, it, that and I mean, it, it, I guess you know got the Taliban to the table in the sense that they would accept this deal, which they did accept and are still, I mean, the Taliban spokesman just before we started said, we're going to honor our commitment to not allow terrorist attacks from the, against the United States from Afghanistan. You know, we're not going to punish everyone and anyone in the former government. Um, and it's kind of still sticking to the, uh, the Doha agreement. So they have some kind of legitimacy. But anyways, I think the, I think the important thing is that the generals, the Pentagon, the White House, they've always known that this was the inevitable anyway, unless we just stayed forever, hold up on a base in Kabul. Um, but what they didn't have was a president that was willing to say, 
I'm going to end the war. And uh, I accept the responsibility for it looking bad. The Taliban is coming and taking over. And it's funny that Biden is that person because Biden doesn't have any guts. He never has been advocating for withdrawal from Afghanistan because it's the right thing, which it is the right thing. A full and complete and total immediate withdrawal of U.S. troops is the right thing. Biden never uh, advocated for that. He always advocated staying until the Afghan government is stable enough to stand on its own, which was always a pipe dream. Um, and so now the fact that he, I think he was just kind of... Uh, the fall guy, you know, like he came in after campaigning on staying in Afghanistan, criticizing Trump's Taliban agreement and saying that we need to leave 3000, 4000 troops because we can't abandon the Afghan government. After a couple months in office, he's like, actually, you know what, we're going to we're going to leave Afghanistan fully. Um, and so now he's having a you know, you, he does press conferences now and asks for Afghanistan. And he's like, what do you mean the Taliban is going to take over? What are you talking about? So instead of having a instead of having a president saying, finally, I'm willing to do the right thing even though it's going to end up uh, like aesthetically bad. It's still a war that we need to get out of. Um, you know, he didn't do that for that reason. He did it because he thought, I mean, and the reason and the proof that Biden thought it was going to like look good for him, like I'm the one who ended the war that Americans are tired of, which they are. Polls show that like 70% of Americans support the withdrawal. Um, Biden actually thought he could have like a 9-11 like victory lap celebration. And they've been planning this event for 9-11 where he could boast about how our administration ended the war. We did it. We ended a long, unpopular, forever war. Um, I don't think they're going to be doing that celebration anymore. And even in back in April, the last thing I'll say is even back in April, like they were getting some good press around this. They're ending the war. People want the war to end. You know, this is maybe a good thing. Kamala Harris came out, dropped leaked to the press back in April. Like I actually, you know, I helped convince Biden to do an, a complete withdrawal. And the last person Biden talked to before he made his decision was me, Kamala Harris, kind of trying to take credit because she anticipated that the story was actually going to look good for the Biden administration. Um, and I think now that the press is pretty negative, uh, it's a pretty humiliating, embarrassing defeat for the U.S. that their uh, forces, their puppet forces fell like so dramatically quickly. But the Pentagon knew. I mean, you had Pentagon insiders weeks ago saying the Taliban will probably take over within 30 days. And actually, for a couple of months, they've been saying that. And so uh, there's a real disconnect between what Biden and Harris were kind of projecting out to the public and what the actual Pentagon officials were, were telling people. And so what is the reason that why why are people, why is the withdrawal happening when it's happening? I mean, I think the U.S. wanted really just needed to get out. I mean, I think that there is. I mean, obviously, the U.S. is going to stay engaged in some way. Um, they're going to be continue probably bombing Afghanistan whenever they feel like it, just like they did a B-52 bombing just a week ago against a school and a health clinic and killed about 20 civilians. There's still going to be CIA uh, operatives and proxy forces on the ground, you know, the death squads that have been terrorizing the country for 20 years. They're, of course, still going to be there. But the U.S. the U.S. lost, and I think a lot of people thought like, "Oh, well, there's just money to be made in the Afghanistan war, and so they're going to stay forever." Um, so it's it's like the the state, which includes the military establishment, the job of the state is to uh, advance the collective interests of the ruling class, right? Um, and so, yes, there are particular industries, the weapons manufacturers, the mining companies, um, energy companies that probably aren't happy with the withdrawal, with the withdrawal. Um, but it's not about this or that uh, part of not, not this or that sector of the ruling class um, that matters. It's what collectively is good for the empire. What's collectively good for American capitalism and American imperialism. And so the state, the military establishment, calculated that you know we're not really achieving our objectives here. We can't have a puppet government because the Taliban are too powerful. We can't defeat the Taliban. And this idea of like, oh well, we can just be there to like steal all of Afghan. Uh, Afghanistan's mineral resources. Well, you, how are you going to build a mine if you're coming under attack by the Taliban constantly? And they knew that it was never going to be resolved. They're never going to be able to build a pipeline through Afghanistan or mine Afghanistan so long as they were in a war with the Taliban. And so they figured we can get out of Afghanistan and then just do what we do with every country that we don't, we try to like negotiate with them, sanction them if they don't do what, they, what we want, bomb them if they don't do what we want, but try to get something out of the situation because I knew that staying and fight, fighting endlessly uh, wasn't going to. And so, you know, they felt that they were enough they, that the time had finally come. They had a president who was willing to uh, 
bear, whether he was conscious of it or not, bear the brunt of all the negative press that's going to come down. And then they're going to treat probably the Taliban government like they do uh, others that they try to get something out of who, you know, they don't approve of everything they do, but they say, that, well, you know, as long as you'll meet our strategic interests, uh, we'll work with you. And if you don't, we'll just bomb you. And what do you say to the people who are are arguing that, you know, the poll is bad because um, women are going to be especially vulnerable under the Taliban? Like, I I'm not talking about cynical people who uh, have shitty politics. I, I guess I I'm talking about people who really are in good faith are worried about the civilian population. So what's your response to that? Sure. Well, it's like the the backwardness that exists there, first of all, is a construct of the United States. It was it's the legacy of U.S. intervention in the country that even brought to prominence these reactionary forces, these right wing forces. I mean, they completely uh, were born from the U.S. intervention in the 80s. So so first off, the situation for women in Afghanistan is because of the United States in the first place. So the idea that it could be solved by continued U.S. intervention um, is just also kind of absurd. Um, you know, many everyone talks about the Taliban's treatment of women, but the Afghan puppet government was also really bad toward women. And that was never really uh, scandalous in the media that the Afghan puppet government had almost like the same uh, policies towards women as the Taliban. Uh, I think the kind of cosmetic, they got a lot of, they would get some flack for that and they'd, they'd have to pivot to make it seem like that they were, uh, that they were welcoming. Um, but U.S. for, so the, to understand that the majority of civilian casualties for people who care about women in Afghanistan are from U.S. airstrikes um, and U.S. forces and U.S. proxy forces. So it's, it's kind of disingenuous to say, you know, if we, we need to, the U.S. military can play some sort of role of protecting women in Afghanistan, when how many women have been killed by U.S. airstrikes um, over the last 20 years? A lot. Um, and, you know, and the U.S. The government doesn't doesn't care about that. I mean, they're happy to work with Saudi Arabia. They're happy to work with other countries that have horrible uh, repressive policies towards women. And they will be happy to work with the Taliban as long as the Taliban say, hey, we're, re we're ready to work with you. Um, the, the U.S. government, Washington, will just forget about all the, the criticisms they have of the Taliban's treatment um, of women. Uh, so I think it'll be, um, you know, and, and just one thing I'll say about the conduct of U.S. forces in Afghanistan. There is a uh, expose by The Intercept. Um, it was covered on like Democracy Now, but pretty much, I think the Washington Post did a story on it also. But the CIA, you know, the Special Activities Division, the CIA soldiers, like ground troops, um, did a couple operations where they went to religious schools in Afghanistan. Um, they rounded up, and these are children in the women's schools. They rounded up these children. Some of them were as young as eight years old, nine years old. Uh, they took them all into one room together, and then they executed all of them. I mean, this is Americans, CIA uh, soldiers, ground troops, who were executing children, shooting children in the head uh, to create this sense of terror that if you one day, you know, this is what happens if you uh, go to a religious school that could one day feed people into the ranks of the Taliban army. And that's pretty brutal. And that's all pretty emblematic, pretty representative of the uh, conduct of Afghan military, Afghan special operations, U.S. special operations. I mean, summary executions were so, so commonplace, especially by special operations, U.S. and CIA uh, and others. So the idea that that, that the, uh, occupying military force that is carrying out over the last 20 years, these type of actions can be some sort of force that can protect people is, is just false. Afghanistan can come forward. It can move towards progress, just like so many other countries that are plagued with the backwardness of just the impact of U.S. imperialism on the countries. They can't begin to move forward. They can't begin to progress until they solve that main contradiction, which is the contradiction with imperialism and occupying foreign army. And so any forces in Afghanistan women's activists, organizations, so forth, like none of that will be able to get momentum or steam or push Afghanistan in the direction that it needs to go socially if there's a war in the country between an occupying imperialist power, multiple ones, and an insurgent force that's fighting it that gets pretty popular fighting it because most people don't like the foreign occupying troops. So of course we want to see social progress in Afghanistan, but that is a chapter that has to start with the elimination of an occupying imperialist force that becomes, when that exists, it becomes, it sucks up everything. It becomes the main problem in the country. And 
I think now that that's gone, uh, I think there opens up entirely new space for there to be social progress. And I don't want to, and the last thing I'll say is, I don't want to paint any kind of rosy picture of the Taliban or make any optimistic predictions about the kind of uh, government that they're going to impose on the country. But I will say that there was just uh, one of the recent statements by the Taliban was saying, we want to create a, a unity government. We're not going to um, and, and even said specifically, we believe in the right of women to get an education and so forth. And so they seem to be kind of trying to play. Uh, they want to have some kind of PR around the fact that we're not what everyone says we are. We're not going to do things that are objectionable. We're going to be a legitimate government of a sovereign country on the world stage. So I don't want to give that too much uh, credence or believability. I mean, we'll have to see. But that's also the kind of thing you don't see in the, you know, the, the dire projections. Not only that, but also the fact that the impact on women by the U.S. occupation. Right. Yeah, that's a really important uh, d discussion and point. And, and the civilian deaths are something that don't really get talked about. Um, can you also share what made you change your politics? I mean, you were <clears throat> in the army. So what uh, what changed your politics? Why are you anti-war oh, now? And were you what was your what were your politics like when you enlisted? Uh, well, like I said, I joined before 9-11. So it was a uh, just a different climate, you know, joining the military, everyone that I was in training with, everyone was just like, oh, we're not going to have to go to war. Like that's great. Like the last war in our memory was like the Gulf War, which like, you know, barely anyone went. And all the soldiers that died in the Gulf War, like 99% died from friendly fire from a, everyone blowing themselves up. Um, so there wasn't really a consciousness that like, oh, we're going to go to war. I mean, there's these short little things. The memory of Vietnam was like, that was the way wars were fought in the past wars aren't fought this way anymore. So everyone in my generation who joined was like, oh, we're never going to go to war. Um, I think the Iraq war just in particular was um, just so outrageous, so heinous that it didn't matter how much propaganda and racism we were fed. I mean, being in Iraq as an occupying soldier, you kind of pretty quickly um, see that everything that Bush and Cheney and Rumsfeld were saying on TV when you were going were just complete lies and that there is no justification to be there. And I think the thing that turned me around, which was the thing for most soldiers, because thousands of active duty people turned against the Iraq war, the Afghanistan war too, but predominantly the Iraq war, um, is realizing we'd be doing the same thing if, if we were Iraqi and seeing what the what US forces were doing in the country. I mean, even if you know they weren't, you know, the people that were just driving around shooting random people, which was happening, just the just being there, just being this kind of messed up occupying force that, you know, imposing this new government on people, subjecting people to checkpoints and home raids and all of these things, uh, everyone and, and everyone that I was with was basically being like, if I was Iraqi, I'd be shooting at American forces. Like, you know, who wouldn't? I mean, it was like Red Dawn. Everyone was like, this is like Red Dawn, except we're the bad guys. So it wasn't, it wasn't a big leap for, for people to not only see through the propaganda, but um, identify with the people that we were told were our enemies and see a great deal of commonality between uh, the Iraqi people and ourselves. And that that's really what, what moved me was feeling an intense uh, brotherhood and kinship and commonality with the people that I was interacting with every day as an occupying soldier and understanding when, you know, like it reached the point where we'd be getting attacked and I'd be like, I get, I support, I, I support this, even though, uh, you know, I might die. I also, I definitely support that this is happening because I had become so like disgusted with, um, with what, what Iraqi people were made to live under. And so I think that that's actually happens in every war that the U S wages. And that's really the history of U S intervention is in every war. I mean, going back to the 1800s, U S occupation of the Philippines and so forth, you had soldiers who basically switched sides. And, um, I think that's going to be the case in future wars also, um, but it's also part of the history of the Afghanistan war. And uh, large numbers of Afghanistan veterans became fighters and activists against it. And there is much a part of the history as, um, you know, the people that, the history that's gonna be written for us. And we should remember that like after Obama like ended the Iraq war, you know, he declared this new national holiday. I think it was called like Freedom Day or something, marking the end of the Iraq war and just laid out this whole this is the legacy of the Iraq war. And the, the White House gave their own kind of convoluted narrative of the history of the Iraq war, which was completely false and fake. 
And so it's up to it's up to people like us to make sure that they don't do the same thing with the Afghanistan war. They're going to try to rewrite the narrative, rewrite the history of what happened, what U.S. forces did. Um, but, you know, of course, it's going to bear no resemblance to what really happened. And that's up to like the grassroots independent media to make sure that stuff is still on the record. And a lot of people are talking about the poppy fields. Um, what do you know what the role, uh, the significance of those are in, in the motives of the United States? Yeah, Afghanistan is like the biggest heroin producer. I mean, it wasn't until the U.S. invasion. The Taliban had kind of strict rules against cultivation of opium. And so they had eradicated most of the opium production in the country. Um, the U.S. comes in and, you know, I think there's a lot of speculation that like, the CIA wanted the opium because it was using it for like dark money for black ops. And there probably was some degree of that. Um, the Taliban and the U S basically allowed the cultivation, cultivation of, of poppy in the country, the Taliban, because it was a big money maker. Um, they had moral uh, objection to it, but when you're fighting a war against not only the United States, but all of the NATO powers, all the big imperialist countries and all their technological advance, you know, it helps to have, you know, a, a few million dollars a week rolling in and heroin money. Um, but also the U.S. allowed um, the heroin production because the U.S. is stationed in all these middle of nowhere areas in Afghanistan. Um, they're having to um, they're having to have the loyalty of local farmers, people that they want to trust and say, don't let the Taliban put IEDs on our path. Tell us if there is uh, insurgents that are going to come kill us. So in order to maintain good relationships with you know farmers in the countryside, they had to not just not just let them grow opium, but protect the opium fields. And so you'll hear any any soldier who is stationed in an area where they're growing opium. I mean, you really wouldn't be allowed to walk. There'd be paths where there'd probably be IEDs on them, where you know if you're going to walk down this path, you're going to get blown up. Then there's the opium fields where you know, oh, if we walk through the field, there's probably not a good chance it's going to be an ID because where would you put them? It's so it's such a huge field. But they would get in trouble for walking through the opium fields because then the farmer would get mad and then they'd call the commander and then the commanders would say, don't walk through the opium fields. Uh, so then who knows how many uh, people are walking around right now or not walking around in wheelchairs or missing arms and legs, missing their genitals simply because uh, they didn't want to, you know, they didn't want to walk through the, the opium fields because it would make... Uh, someone that the commanders thought strategically was important to like not make mad. And so that kind of just speaks to the absurdity of the war the entire time. Um, the U.S. of course would have liked to have a puppet government in Afghanistan where they could, you know, the a big pharma buys opium from places like India. I mean, it is a commodity on the market. The U.S. doesn't really grow it itself. Um, so of course the U.S., if they had won the Afghanistan war, would have thought, oh great, now we have a supply of opium that's under our own uh, jurisdiction. And so, yes, that was probably one of the ideal outcomes for the U.S. war in the country is not just the oil industry, um, not just the mineral industry, not just the defense industry, but big pharma had a lot to gain from it also. So I think that's why you're seeing a lot of opposition in the media and the elites, the corporate media. There's a lot of anger about the withdrawal right now. Number one, because it's just humiliating and it makes the U.S. look bad. And so they're all mad that it happened in such a disastrous way. But there are sectors of the ruling class that are like, pissed that they're going to miss out on a huge cash crop unless they can have some like long shot deal with the Taliban. And it's funny because normally the media is just the stenographers of the Pentagon. Um, but it's more that they're just, not, they're just supporters of war, no matter what war it is. Because even when the, Pen the Pentagon wants to leave, this is the Pentagon's plan. And so like the first time I've ever seen the kind of entirety of the establishment media and all these big talking heads go against this wishes of like pretty much the entire Pentagon establishment is when they're actually like pulling back from a war. So it kind of made me reevaluate that they're not, they don't just repeat everything the Pentagon says, they repeat everything the Pentagon says when it's at pushing more war around the world. Oh, yeah, that's really interesting. And finally, uh, uh, Brian Frederick asks, isn't this withdrawal in part to help with the new cold war with China? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's probably the most important thing about this. When Obama came into office, um, and he came on very critical of Bush's wars in Iraq and in Afghanistan. He said, we, you screwed up Afghanistan. That should have been a quick, easy out, in and out war. But the case that Obama made was not that uh, Iraq was just immoral and wrong. Afghanistan uh, it was a complete mistake to do this. His thing was 
the American empire has become bogged down in the Middle East and it is preventing us from pointing towards our real enemy, which is China and this doctrine of great power confrontation. And the Asia pivot, many people know that term, the Asia pivot, pivot, which was Obama's foreign policy orientation towards confronting China and building up military forces against China and rallying all our allies and potential allies to create confrontation and conflict with China, pivot away from what? He meant pivot to Asia from the Middle East. And so that was the Obama doctrine, pivot away from the Middle East towards our real enemy, China. Um, and so, yes, the, the drawdown, which is also happening in Iraq, the drawdown in Afghanistan, this is much, very much a reorientation. That's been happening for a little while, a, a reorientation of U.S. foreign policy and imperialism to try to disrupt and confront China and, and other places in the world uh, as well. But it's, it's harder to do that when you're bogged down in a lost war. Um, and so, yes, that's obviously something everyone needs to be very conscious of is you know, I see a lot of comments about how this is the empire's crumbling, the empire's in decline because it's been dealt this big, embarrassing, humiliatory, uh, humiliating military defeat. Um, you know, it was defeated very badly in Korea. The U.S. was defeated very badly in Vietnam. That didn't mean the, the U.S. kind of backed off and, oh, man, we got to, like, relax on this war stuff. They just went towards other parts of the world. They went to Latin America. They went to the Middle East. I mean, it, it doesn't matter. And it's almost like they need to redeem themselves. You know, like after the defeat in Vietnam, they're like, ah, like, you know, communism got one over on us, but we're going to get one over on the communists in Latin America and sponsor all these dirty wars and start uh, funding coups of independent and socialist governments ar around the world. And so it's, they're not going to take this well. They know they look very bad. And what, what can they do to recover from it is focus everyone's attention on uh, some, other, some other theater or some other kind of American victory uh, around the world, which, you know, we should be a little nervous about. Um, but also prepared to um, prepared to confront it because that's of course what's necessary. Right. Well, Mike, thank you so much. You've been so generous with your time, and I really appreciate this. And I'm gonna. People are asking about where. What are your sources for that thing you're talking about with the CIA um, killing kids? So luckily, I'll I'm, I'll make sure to link. Uh, sure. I'll link to that video that you guys did at uh, Empire Files. Great. And please come back. This was great. And where can people sure. find you? Uh, on Twitter at Mike Preisner and, um, just go to YouTube empire files. That's where most of my work lives. Great. And don't go anywhere guys. Cause we're going to be talking more with some other great guests, um, including Leslie Lee and Jamie Peck. Um, and we can also, maybe I'll play while, uh, Leslie and Jamie get ready. Maybe I'll play part of that, of your, uh, your great video. Like cool. Unless hopefully I don't get kicked off of YouTube for some kind of copyright <laughs> infringement. But again, thank you so much, Mike, for your time. Really appreciate it. Thanks for doing the story. Thank you. Bye. That was so great, guys. That was really great. There's some people in the chat who are like criticizing him. It's so weird. I don't know what your deal is, you weird, uh, like weird trolls. If you want to say something, you know, cat, like pay some money and give me some evidence that this, per uh, I mean, obviously I don't believe what you're going to say, but I'll read what you want to say, maybe, unless it's totally offensive. Um, but uh, yeah, we're gonna have a, oh, thank you, um, Mahmoud Miradi. Thank you so much. Um, and Mike Preisner is the man. Um, and uh, we are going to uh, have, we're gonna keep going with the show. Let me just see. Uh, let me see though, if I can uh, call up that video because it's so good, the video that he made, hold on. And then we're gonna talk more about, about Afghanistan. Um, hold on, let me play this for a little bit. It's really good. Empire Files. Guys, share the stream, like the stream. Um, okay, let's see, where is it? Um, Empire Files videos. Uh, okay, Death Squads in Afghanistan, there it is. Okay, ready? This is actually a great video. Um, let me try to Okay, let me play this for a little bit. In fact, I'm gonna go full screen. Don't go anywhere. This is a great video, but you have to make sure um, it is playing because I'm not sure if it is. All right, I will ignore the, the trolls tonight. Hold on one second. Um, tell me if this is audio, if the audio works or not. It probably won't for me, but will for you. That often happens. Ah, okay. Tell me if, this, if you guys can hear this. Yeah. 
from the organization that brought you Oops, No More Kennedys, and Topple Me Elmo. It's the Central Intelligence Agency Special Activity Division in Afghanistan action figure. They may look American, but if they do anything bad, they never exist. Complete with realistic features based off the real American heroes like Smug Grin, Bulletproof Moo Moo, Special Guatemala Edition Radio guaranteed to make whoever's listening think they're being cool. Regular pants. But most importantly, it's a backpack full of American taxpayer dollars to pay some other guys to do shit that makes you, a seasoned CIA professional, want to fucking hurl. Use the backpack cash to raise an army of foreign fighters. Foreign fighter accessories come with these death squad actions. Summary executions of whole families. Raiding medical clinics of Western NGOs just give an aspirin to the wrong piece of shit. Find eight-year-olds profile as potential future Taliban and kill them before they're old enough to hold a gun. You'd kill baby Hitler, wouldn't you? And add another layer of secrecy so that no matter what they do, the U.S. government can deny all knowledge. This limited release won't come again until the next war in Afghanistan, so get your down the Empire Files dot TV. Warning, foreign writers may cause us to censor the SDA side in 9-11. Perhaps the most notorious piece of Central Intelligence Agency history is its creation and management of death squads. It's most known for doing so in Latin America. This record is long, consistent, and quite disturbing. It's an irrefutable story of CIA-directed mass murder of civilians for no other reason than to protect the rule of the rich from social movements of the poor. The CIA will secretly organize among the scattered groups, attempting to unify them into one opposition force. But meanwhile, General, we are financing at, at least a, a modest level of the proxy war against the Nicaraguan government. Uh, that's, that's what, what I read in the newspapers. I do not. You didn't know that when you were in the government? government? <laughs> I do not uh, find that uh, illogical or morally repugnant. But the key to the CIA's rebranding exercise today is the idea that their era of running death squads is a thing of the past. That was the old CIA, a different time, a complicated history. But this narrative couldn't be more false. In this episode, we'll be talking about just one place the CIA has been running them for the last 20 years. In Afghanistan, the case study and U.S. imperial disaster. While the CIA sponsored Afghan militias through the 80s, they never really left and had already been preparing to overthrow the Taliban government using them prior to 9-11. About 18 months before 9-11, I and the others in my station were working very hard to try to organize a anti-Taliban tribal rebellion in the South. But we were reaching out and establishing relationships that we hoped would enable us to lead that sort of rebellion if and when the order came to go forward. And obviously that order came to go forward in uh, the immediate days after 9-11. Right behind me is the Jawbreaker 9-1101 MI-17 helicopter. This helicopter was used just 15 days after the attack on 9-11. And seven men and $3 million from CIA made its way from Uzbekistan into Afghanistan in the middle of the night and paved the way for the coming invasion. Handing out millions in cash, the CIA quickly had its own arm in Afghanistan, which immediately played a leading role in the war, using them to do most of the dirty work outside the legal boundaries of the U.S. military, made them very valuable to the American occupation. It has always been a highly controversial policy. Even Afghan President Hamid Karzai, who himself had been on the CIA payroll, opposed allowing the CIA militias to exist under his new government. But a puppet president has no real power in a neo-colony of the U.S. Empire. 
look, look at, at the, the end, end of the day, day unless, unless we're going to colonize, colonize Afghanistan, Afghanistan uh, we, we need to have some, some sort of a political dispensation in that country. And so initially, we were hoping that, that the Taliban would be that. The CIA created a secretive web of militias under various names, but basically established two main units. The first, called the Coast Protection Force in Northeast Afghanistan, which is just fully under... Okay, so I have an echo. Uh, uh, whoops. Okay, I have an echo apparently, right? Hold on. This film is called um, CIA. What is it? CIA Death Squads. Hold on one second. Um, what is it called? CIA Stories Death Squads in Afghanistan. CIA, I'm putting this in the chat. CIA Stories. Death squads. But don't go anywhere. Actually, Afghanistan. Oh my gosh. Okay. And it's from and it's Empire Files. Okay. I don't know why it started. Why would it start? Uh, what's weird is I didn't change anything. Um, so I'm not sure why the echo started. One second. Okay. Um, so guys, we're gonna, okay, let's, uh, how do I do this so I keep watching? Did anything change? Um, yeah, I mean, guys, can you just deal with the echo? I don't know what to say. Hold on. CIA how do you hear it? And is headquartered at a major CIA, CIA base. base. The second is the Special Forces of Afghanistan's own intelligence agency, the National Director If I mute my mic, you can't. They run operations in the rest of Afghanistan. While the NDS Special Forces are technically part of the Afghan military, they are trained, funded, and actually under the control of the CIA. Because of the secretive nature of these militia fighters, the exact size is unknown, but it's estimated to be around 10,000. Their primary function is to conduct raids of villages where people are suspected of opposing the U.S. occupation or being pro-Taliban, but often it's based on totally bogus rationale. For example, if the Taliban enter a village one night demanding food and villagers provide food in fear of crossing the Taliban, they're subject to CIA raids for the crime of aiding terrorism. Now, raids of villages are pretty standard for all U.S. and Afghan military forces. So what do they actually do that would qualify them as death squads? Because even in comparison to conventional forces, the havoc and death they unleash is stunningly higher. According to the United Nations Mission in Afghanistan report in 2018, which was a year of record civilian deaths by conventional Afghan security forces, the CIA teams killed about the same number of civilians. That means as many as the Afghan local police, the Afghan National Police, the Afghan Army, and the Afghan Air Force combined. The UN report also found a much higher ratio of civilian deaths to injuries, which led them to conclude, quote, the high number of fatalities compared to the number of injured suggests that force was employed indiscriminately, in particular, summary executions. To put that into context, if the CIA militias number around 10,000, the combined Afghan security forces outnumber that by over 300,000 personnel. Basically, the Central Intelligence Agency manages to kill as many civilians as a force more than 30 times larger than it, which is itself known for widespread civilian deaths. Listen to Mike Pompeo when he was director of the CIA explain their strategy. We can't perform our mission. If we're not aggressive. Can you guys still hear? You can hear? Okay, cool. Aggressive. Vicious, unforgiving, relentless. Vicious, unforgiving, relentless. You pick the word. Every minute we have to be focused on crushing our enemies. Here's what aggressive, unforgiving, and relentless translates to on the ground. In Paktia, CIA forces raided the home of a village patriarch, who was also a member of the Provincial Peace Council. He, alongside five of his family members, were shot one by one in the head. One witness testified, 
A wolf from the mountains doesn't carry out such actions. They shot them in the eyes and mouths where the women were sitting. I can't explain. And those young people, they were the future of Afghanistan, students at university. In Coast, they raided a home and took one man for interrogation. While they were torturing him outside, CIA forces executed his two brothers and sister before setting the house on fire. Inside, they left a three-year-old girl trapped in the house who burned alive in the blaze. In a Kandahar town, they took 20 men from their homes and summarily executed all of them in front of the village. In August 2019, in Kulalgo village, they quote, blew open the doors of the house and shot four men in front of the rest of the family. In another house, they fatally shot three shopkeepers and one of their guests, all of whom were home for Eid celebrations. In the third incident, they killed a religious teacher and two construction workers. One witness said, the residents complied. There was no resistance. They were separated from other family members and taken to separate rooms and shot dead. In October 2018, in the Rodot district of Nangahar, 13 civilians were executed, including a nine-year-old boy, with CIA forces shooting children as they ran to the bodies of their loved ones. Executing children is not just collateral damage in attacks on suspected militants. As All right, guys, isn't this good? Isn't this so good? We're going to... Um... We're gonna watch a little bit more, but um, yeah, shout out to, uh, this is like the um, Empire Files appreciation stream because we got Mike Preisner and then uh, Abby, Abby uh, Martin and Mike Preisner's documentary, CIA stories, death squads in Afghanistan. Okay, let me, but don't go anywhere guys. We're gonna bring you a little bit more, okay. You. Part of the Trump Pompeo relentless and unforgiving escalation, the CIA started directly targeting children who might one day grow up to be supporters of the Taliban. A shocking expose out today in The Intercept reveals CIA backed death squads in Afghanistan have killed children as young as eight years old in a series of night raids, many targeting madrasas, Islamic religious schools. In December 2018, one of the death squads attacked a madrasa in Wardak province, killing 12 boys, the youngest nine years old. Those 12 boys that had been taken out of the several dormitories had been massacred in a room. There are several accounts of this exact scenario playing out in raids on medical clinics, adding yet another war crime to the paramilitary's rap sheet. In one example, on July 8, 2019, CIA militia attacked a medical clinic run by a Swedish NGO because they supposedly gave treatment to someone in the Taliban. CIA forces tied up all the clinic's staff. They took four of the men, including the head doctor who ran the clinic, into a separate room. In that room, three of the men were executed. The lead doctor was disappeared. Now, some CIA defenders might say they can't control what these Afghan fighters do. It's the same defense they used for their death squads in Central America. We just trusted our allies, and they turned out to do some heinous stuff. We didn't know what they were actually doing. Well, they can't use that excuse in Afghanistan. That's because when the Coast Protection Forces or NDS Special Forces launch these murder raids, they aren't just dropped off by American pilots and given American air support. The CIA commandos are actually on the ground with them, giving the orders. In one CIA raid in Torgar, one survivor recounted, when my father opened the gate, they shot him dead. Then they tossed a grenade, killing my mother. While watching both his parents murdered, Khan stated he heard men yelling in English. Even in the mass murder of children at religious schools, multiple survivors reported there were Americans present. 
In 2015, the Washington Post interviewed witnesses from six different massacres by the CIA paramilitary forces. In every instance, they recounted hearing English being spoken by armed men who had interpreters with them. The same report also interviewed former Afghan commanders in the CIA paramilitary. One said, The orders came from the Americans. They were the real bosses. This pattern shows that these paramilitaries, under direct command and supervision of the CIA, carry out summary executions of civilians as a matter of routine policy, without a doubt earning the label of a death squad. Sadly, it doesn't end there. The Afghan people don't just have to worry about being shot to death by the CIA troops, but the airstrikes that come before and after the notorious raids. U.S. forces are well known for reckless massacres by air, especially in the past few years when airstrikes increased to pave their retreat in blood. But the CIA has a different level of impunity and freedom to rain hellfire on civilians with their own aerial arsenal. In March 2019, CIA militia was searching the village of Nasir Kill, calling in airstrikes on civilian homes. One survivor told Human Rights Watch, the airstrikes hit two houses, a soldier of the Afghan National Army, his wife, and four children were in one of those houses. All were killed. The village doctor, his wife, and their five daughters were in the other house that was hit. Hi guys, look who it is, live and in person. Guys, this is Leslie Lee, you probably know. You've seen us together, but have you ever seen us together in the same space since uh, before COVID? No, I don't think so. All Absolutely right. not. Yeah. So uh, we're going to keep watching the, the video for a little bit. Hello, everyone. Hey, how's it going? Yeah. We'll keep watching the video for a little bit as we get, as Jamie, Jamie. Gets, re gets ready. Yeah. So here we can watch with people, actually. Let's Very see. good video. Uh, and then we. And all of them died. A total of 13 civilians were killed. There are countless other stories like this. Masi Mubarez, a villager in Mula Hafiz, lost his entire family in a CIA airstrike on their home. His wife, his seven children, and four of his young nieces. The youngest was his four-year-old son. Mubarez told investigators, I have lost everyone. I am alone now. There's no hope for accountability for past crimes or stopping future ones because the CIA and its militia forces operate in the dark under no official chain of command, off limits to the kind of scrutiny that can be leveled against conventional American-led forces. And while journalists and human rights organizations have uncovered many of the horror stories I've shared in this episode, we can only assume that most of what they've done remains hidden away in the shadows how many incidents have no survivors left to tell the tale? As the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan begins to take shape, it's clear the U.S. will not really fully leave. But perhaps the biggest remaining footprint of the U.S. empire will be the CIA's death squads, which were hatched long before the U.S. occupation, and they'll surely outlive it. Wanted to make sure that people saw because people were talking about the sources. Okay, that was pretty perfect timing. Hello, everyone. We're back. Hello. Hi, and this is Jamie Peck. Wow, we who looks very small because she's farther away <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> from the camera. Because I'm a tiny person. She's a tiny person. Yeah. Let's see. All right. See, I'm normal size. Just kidding. Hi. Hi, everyone. <laughs> so that was a very serious uh, thing that we were watching, and all praise be upon Mike Preisner and also Abby Martin. Um, and the Empire Files. And yeah, this is a real life get together. And um, we are going to be taking some questions from you and then we're going to uh, be moving the stream to Patreon. But uh, guys, what questions do you have? And of course we have veto power, but if you have any questions that we approve of. Um, oops, you know what? That's okay. We don't really need this, do we? Yeah. 
I don't know. Really? I just realized just now, looking at myself in the screen, how sunburned I am from earlier. You don't today. look sunburned at all. I took a little walk. Oh around, wow! Around you just look morning. rosy cheeked. All right. Well, I'm sunburned. Oh, I can't <laughs> tell. Let's see. Is this? You know what it is? Sorry. Hi, everyone. Okay. Let's see. So we can do it like a formal. I should have. Let's see. Huh. You know what? We don't need that light. Okay. So that was great, right? Um. Uh. Why was the takeaway so quick? Uh, why do you let, all right, dude, I, I'm going to, I was going to, um, Leslie, should I just block or warn? What's yeah, the no, because here's a, here's a, here's a true story. Uh, the first time I met Abby, I was at your live show. You invited Abby and there was two weird guys who came, came there just to heckle her. I'm sure Mike gets a lot of same. Yeah. There's like this group of the, people these haters. who just kind of follow Jesus them around Christ. and go every single place there. And certainly they go online. Uh, so. Yeah. Yeah, lots of hate, lots of weird haters. Yeah, <laughs> lots of weird haters. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, you feel free to ask us questions. Um, we're here for you. And the Patreon is um, uh, five dollars a month. But um, thoughts on California recall election? Um, you know that we're gonna have to look into for next and the other one. I know it's so much better with the light on. Hold on, let me try to figure this out. I really do. I do not. Did it run out? It's not that bad. Big of a deal. Oh, there. Okay, there great. But look, you want, we want it more yellow, right? More yellow or blue, which is better? I don't care. Mm, what do we think? Nice. Oh, you look. Well, you're the host. You get I'm the host. Say. Okay, which is better on me? Yeah, yeah, but I want you to make sure that you're. That pretty good. All right, cool. As long as we're nice and like washed out to hide our imperfections. <laughs> what imperfections? Just kidding. Oops. All right. Okay, that goes yeah, up and down. Good. All right. I need to get one of these. It's yeah, cool. it's actually. Yeah, more blue looks better. Oh, well. All right, you guys uh, like blue, I think. Which is more flattering, though? That's what we care about. <laughs> anyway, um, so that good. was a really serious thing, and I don't mean to mix um, mm -hmm. laughing with uh, way too red. All right, hold on. Let's try the other one. We'll, we'll, we'll listen to PL. That's yeah, the I know. The person in the chat will listen. Okay, what do we think? I actually think the no, and you I can like, see uh, your I nose looks redder. To, oh, yeah, whatever. I feel like uh, we're doing, like, Instagram uh, filters IRL. <laughs> yeah. Well, whatever we are, that's what we're doing. So um, we're gonna, uh, no questions, huh? Well, all right, I should not have asked about the lighting, but uh, <laughs> we're gonna have to get back. Okay, this is perfect. We'll get we'll get to your questions later, but um, should we, I think like we can wrap it up. I'll probably cut this part out. It's a little bit weird to, uh, what do you guys think? What? I don't know, I need to be stopped. You know what, it's fine. This is a great show, Make yeah. sure you know? And we're going to do a Patreon thing. And if you want to see me and Leslie and Jamie answer some of your questions, um, and thank you, Rock and Red. But if you want to do that, um, you can. Is Jamie going to dish on the majority report? I don't know. Mm, mm. I'm going to go with no. No, she's not. <laughs> but that doesn't mean there won't be some really juicy content. Look, so if you want it. Like, people have tricked me into doing it, but only, like, tangentially. If okay. you ask me directly to do that, the answer is no. Right. So that gives you some some you good... You just have to wait until I forget that I'm trying not to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll we'll move Leslie over more. We'll do that. Um, but, yeah, thank you guys so much for um, for, for coming onto the show, uh, for w looking on the show. Uh, sorry. I'm getting so distracted. Thank you so much <laughs> for coming to this show, which has been a great show. Oh, we got a couple. We got a question. For yeah. you. What's your favorite band? Uh, oh, fuck. Where's that? Mine is the Smashing Pumpkins. Always, always, always. The Smashing Pumpkins. Oh, my God. That's, uh, I'm really impressed that you were able to answer that so quickly because I have a bunch of them and I don't have, like, a single favorite. Which, where are you some of your favorites? I have, like, different categories of bands. My favorite band to see live, problematic fave, probably Swans. Swans? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, I told you this. I knew a guy who was the son of the drummer from Swans. Don't even know what Swans is. He was is. a jerk. Of Thor? Uh, I don't. Cats is his. What's his last name? I don't remember what. I'm trying to get Leslie. Mm -hmm. I don't know which drummer he is. I know they've changed members a few times, but his dad was in Swans. I didn't know this for most of the, uh, the time I knew him, but he was a real asshole. So I never really yeah. liked him. <laughs> I don't want to know anything about them as people. I yeah, just, you don't. I, I don't think you do. It's yeah. <laughs> like a rare geologic event that I have been lucky enough to witness several times but you know the michael gear alleg allegations are not great yeah he's yeah great so sorry sorry for saying swans um 
Uh, oh. The magnetic fields are my favorite. The magnetic fields. Oh, that's cute. Yeah. I, I was jamming also last night on Wax Idols. My friend had the fortune. Oh, Wax Idols. Great, great. Yeah. The great. fortune? Yeah. What did you say? My Heather fortune. Heather I thought fortune. you said my friends had the fortune, and I was like, that's not good. <laughs> No, um, we don't. We both know Heather. She's yeah. really fucking. Yes, cool. we're all fully yeah. back. We're I, all fully back. I actually, I was having a really um, magical night with. Uh, Hold on, uh, did you hear that? Ra really magical night with the fella. That's where we're gonna break <laughs> and go to Patreon. So guys, <laughs> this has been like a really good content. Hi, uh, really good content. Really serious. I don't know who that is. Um, is that the person who was here before or someone else? Oh, I, I, I couldn't I, tell. I couldn't okay. Oh, it's Swans. Is not Zwan. Swan. Yeah, <laughs> Zwan was uh, you know, actually a Billy Corgan Especially pumpkins are all right, but I prefer Zwan. Said no one ever. <laughs> the stream is unauthorized. Yeah. Um. So no, it's not. It's not my mom. But um, we're going to go Elijah. over to Patreon. It's Elijah. Yeah, we're gonna go to Patreon, and I want to thank everyone for tuning in. This has been a great podcast, a great video stream, and um, thank you, Varushka, um, for help for you know working on the show and helping with the show, and thank you so much for. Um, uh, Jamie and uh, Leslie, and thank you so much, Mike Preisner and Abby Martin. And I'm going to respond to the people complaining about the intercept in the Patreon. So go go over to the Patreon. We'll see you there again. Thanks so much for listening and watching the Katie Helper Show. And uh, subscribe, and of course, Patreon.com/slash the Katie Helper Show is where you can see the rest of this stream. And don't even think of complaining because I bring you a lot of free content. And this show today was amazing. Yes. Okay. Tons of content. Tons of content. All right.